Hi guys, this is Rebecca Matolka, Deputy Director of Digital Strategy at the Interior Department. Um, thank you for joining us on another Creative Comms class. Today we have Bob Wick from BLM back to teach us about Lightroom editing. Bob is a wilderness specialist um, and photography is what he does on his side. Um, so we're lucky, he's normally in the California office, um, working remotely, um, but we have him in DC today for this training. So Bob and I are in the same room together um, in case anything happens. And at that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. All right. Let's Let me get the speaker back over here, the mic. Thanks everyone for joining. We have a, a great crowd here uh, today, and I'm, I'm glad because um, I'm not an Adobe representative yeah, by any means, but I'm um, very positive on Lightroom, uh, primarily because I'm a, a photographer exclusively. I do a little bit of video work, which we'll touch on, but I'm not a uh, software guru, and uh, I really um, like the fact that Lightroom has a, a very easy interface to, to work with. That It'll seem a little overwhelming for those of you who are new today uh, to it, but it will, um, I, once you get the knack of it and the concepts, I think you'll find it will be really easy to find things. Um, so the, uh, we have a little echo, there we go. Um, so what is Lightroom for you is the first question. Um, Lightroom is developed, like I said, specifically for photography workflow. So if you take a lot of, a high volume of photos, you want to organize and edit them. Uh, Lightroom is for you, and, and it has very professional results. Um, one of the cool things about Lightroom is anytime you do edits in Lightroom, it creates a sidecar file, uh, which uh, holds all of those edits on that separate file, so it's non-destructive editing. You can always go back to your original file, no matter how bad you edit it or change it or mess it up. You, you're not... Uh, you're not having any problem with that. Um, so the other uh, thing I wanted to mention is, uh, well, sharing images is also very easy, downloading them, sharing them with others, uh, printing, things of that nature. And uh, one of the, the things I want to hit on is this is a beginner level course, so let's focus more on the concepts of Lightroom. Um, there's some really detailed questions that I'm sure a lot of you might have that, um, that we'll be able to answer, or I can answer them either separately offline with you, or you can look them up uh, very uh, quickly on uh, the internet. So um, let's try to stay on, on more of the broad topic questions. Um, one of the nice things is DOI has a, a blanket agreement, a purchase agreement with Adobe for the creative suite, so you can um, ask Hey, your Bob, are you sharing your screen? Can you share your screen for us? Oh, sure. Hold on one second. Are you seeing my screen? Okay. Yeah, we are now. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, I, I was just going over some intro and we'll hop right into the, the program. Um, so, so the department and each agency has their own protocol for setting it up. Um, those of you who have uh, Creative Cloud on your home machines, um, you get immediate updates from Adobe on that. I noticed on BLM software, some of the camera raw uh, settings aren't uh, up to date on that. So you have to, sometimes there's a little lag in each bureau as to, to exactly updating it like it is on the Creative Cloud. Um, again, at home, if you want to purchase it on your own, you don't have to purchase the Creative Cloud like you do with Photoshop. Um, you can pay, I think it's about $200 for, for Adobe Photoshop. Um, also, I want to make it clear that Adobe Lightroom is not an either or to Photoshop. Um, you have uh, lots of plugins that you can use with, with Adobe Lightroom, including Photoshop, and we'll touch on the, the plugins here, uh, or at least the, the Photoshop plugin in a minute. So um, I might also mention that, uh, let me get up here. This. There are lots of uh, shortcuts. I'm not gonna be using a lot of shortcuts today, but as you see where I did the pull down menu right there, um, there are shortcuts listed under each, each pull down menu. So 
those all those things control shift alt c on the right and all those so if you like like shortcuts there's shortcuts for everything um so those of you who shoot raw files adobe lightroom uh treats raw files just like a jpeg or any other file so that's um you know a very big benefit i think of uh, Lightroom. I don't have to go in and, and process my raw files before I use them in Lightroom. They're, they're ready to go there. So with that, let's, um, let's touch on the interface of Lightroom a little bit. There's um, seven different modules. Uh, the modules that I use the most and that I'm going to go over the most today are the library model, module, and that's where you organize your, your photographs. Um, and then the develop module is where you edit your photographs. And we're gonna to touch a little bit on the map module for those of you who use geolocated photos. It, it's a quick and handy tool. And then we'll also touch some on the print module if you uh, uh, want to print out through Lightroom for use in documents and such. I'm not gonna to touch on the web module because this is a, a DOI course and very few of us have direct access to the web. And I'm also not gonna to touch on the Lightroom plugin for uh, iPhones and smartphones. We, we can maybe do that in a different course. And then the slideshow module I'm not gonna touch on, that's mainly for professional photographers who are developing portfolios to show online to uh, customers and things like that. So it'll be uh, plenty of uh, effort just to get through these uh, uh, couple modules. So we'll uh, move through as quickly as we can. Um, Bob, yes. Rebecca, we have a question before you get started into the weeds is, is there a reason you prefer Lightroom to Bridge? Um, one of the things, if you use Bridge, one of the things you'll notice is uh, the library module in Lightroom is very similar to Adobe Bridge. It's just Lightroom is everything is in, in one package. So you don't have to jump between Adobe Bridge and, and Photoshop. You can jump right from the library module here in Lightroom into the develop module which i'm doing right now and start developing that very same photo and then you can go export it and you can do it it's um much more uh efficient to do it in lightroom i think to be honest i i use lightroom um exclusively now with using photoshop as a plugin so i really don't have a need to use bridge but but again you'll see a lot of the same stuff so um, so just touching, there's a, a num number of working panels uh, where you do your work in Lightroom, both on the left side and the right side of the image. These change based on the module that you're working in. Um, if you don't like to see those, if you're like, for instance, I don't work as much on this left panel. So sometimes I'll get rid of it just so I have more photo space. can do the same thing with the right panel or the, the top or bottom panel. Um, and uh, so, so there's uh, another, just a, a shortcut that you can do if you want to look at an individual photo. I'm going to look at it here in the loop view so it covers the whole thing, is you can do uh, lights out, which will take you to just see your photo. And then just hit the L again and it'll take you right back. Um, so let's start learning the interface. The first thing that we need to do in Lightroom is create a catalog. And a catalog is uh, basically, I've been testing some catalogs out there, so I have a bunch of them over there. But we're gonna create a new catalog here, and um, we're going to call it DOI Training. And what this catalog does is the program's gonna shut down, oh I see, so I need to start screen sharing again. Let me wait till Lightroom comes up. The catalog is your interface with all of your photos, and um, what you need to do is, the first thing you need to do when you open Lightroom for the first time is to create that catalog. And then the next thing you need to do is start importing photos and videos into that catalog. And we're gonna import some. I have some on the DOI uh, training. And uh, so I might have a smart card that I, or a compact flash card or SD card from my camera that I just plugged into Lightroom. And Lightroom will recognize that I plugged that in. 
and it's going to ask me if I want to download these photos into my catalog. So we're importing photos now. And what the, um, what the Lightroom catalog is, is that it's just like a library catalog. It, it's your interface with um, your actual photos, which might be, for instance, I have about five terabytes of photos that I've stored on my computer um, this year. Let me see why this is not working here. Um, yeah, this should come in. Okay. Oh, here we go. So I'm going to import these. One of the things that you want to do is um, if you want to, um, if you're importing off a, a card from your camera, you might have a bunch of photos you already imported and you're just adding to that. So you want to check this box, don't import suspected duplicates. Otherwise, you're going to be importing repetitive photos into your catalog. If you want to, you can also make a second copy to a backup drive. I don't have one hooked up right now, so I'm gonna, gonna leave that off. And then the third thing you can do, I'm gonna leave this off just because of time right now, but you can ask Lightroom to build smart previews when you import these photos. Um, so let's see if our import works. It's going a little slow today. Um, so the catalog, like I said, is just like a library catalog. Um, it stores your sidecar files that have information about your edits on the photos. And it also um, just lets you know where to find those photos. So you might have those photos stored on 20 or 30 different disks, external hard drives, and it, it will show you uh, where those, uh, it's your one-stop shop for those photos. Um, I'm gonna shut this off because it's taking We're just having a little slow time here. So I'm gonna go back in and say open recent. So let's just assume we already, oh, this is gonna shut me back down. Bear with me a second here. It'll come back up. So again, if, um, if you're, uh, you just start, I usually just create one, one catalog per year and I have up to 30 or 40,000 photos stored in it. So apologize, we have a slow connection here. Hmm. Art, do you know why it might not be coming up? No, I'm not. If you want to unshare your screen real quick and see if it's, it sounds like it's more of a Lightroom problem than it is. Yeah, a, okay. I don't think it's a, um, I don't think it's a Zoom problem. We have, 451 people watching, no pressure. <laughs> on that. Uh, appreciate everybody's attendance. Um, uh, there's a question is, what is the cost for DOI for Lightroom? Rachel, do you have an answer to that? I don't know what it is. Um, it, it was sent to me directly rather than to you, uh, you, Rebecca. I'm sorry, not Rachel, Rebecca. The VPA for Lightroom, I'm not sure of the exact cost. I know I just got um, Photoshop for two years for less than $200. I would imagine that Lightroom is similarly priced, but we can also send around the VPA oh, information after, uh, after the class with a link to this training. Okay. Uh, that was one of the questions. Um, what other questions do you think there might be? Uh, is there any other questions that you've gotten, Rebecca, while we're waiting for his uh, computer to come back? Most up? of my questions have been about the VPA. Otherwise, um, we will be posting this online at doi.gov slash creative comms under resources uh, so that it'll be available offline after the fact. But those were the two main questions we've had so far. Oh, okay, great. So while we're waiting, Bob, yeah. if- uh, so Can I leave the meeting and rejoin? Our yeah, go ahead and leave the meeting and rejoin and we'll kind of carry it until that time, so. Um, and when she did that though, we lost the audio, so. Um, Rebecca, you might want to turn on your camera, or you might want to turn on your microphone so we can hear you. Uh, so in the bottom, now we can't hear you right now, Rebecca. Bottom left corner, um, there you are, here we are. Now we can hear you now. Using Creative or uh, Lightroom. And I believe Bob had told me earlier that he uses Lightroom for everything. Is that correct, Bob? I do, I use it. I, I use my Photoshop plugin maybe once a month. I use Lightroom daily. 
and I've never had it not open on. <laughs> We're hooked into a DOI network on a BLM computer, so. Um, there are um, some there other are questions, questions coming in. Uh, there's a question that came in, can a catalog be accessed by multiple employees in one office, such as the one on a network drive? So I guess that's to you, Bob, if you want to just talk through Rebecca's while we're rebooting your computer. One of the shortfalls with Lightroom is it can't, the catalog can't be stored on a network drive. It needs to be stored on either an external hard drive or on your computer's hard drive. Um, so those of you that are using it, my, I have smart previews for about 30,000 photos um, and it takes up about 30 gigabytes on my hard drive. If I didn't have the smart previews, then a smart preview allows you to edit the preview on the, um, the computer if your hard level wires not um, It would be about 15 gigabytes. Um, now you can store your photos on the network. The problem is if you don't move your photos around in Lightroom itself, if you just go into your Mac in the Finder or into your um, network or into your uh, Microsoft uh, file moving, it's just like moving a book from one library to another without telling the card catalog you moved it. Lightroom doesn't know how to find it, so you need to tell it where to find that if it's moved outside of Lightroom. You can move it around inside of Lightroom anywhere you want, um, but you can't move it outside of Lightroom. Okay, great. Um, there's so another the question. Thing, you know, we could, uh, oh, you are restart. I could hook up my Mac, but I don't know if. Yeah, he could log in on his Mac, but I don't know if he can get uh, onto the network. Wi -Fi That's the thing. Does not, you can't do an external computer. Oh, you can't. Okay. okay. So, okay, hey, we'll Rachel, Rachel, can you hear uh, right so now? Can that's, you guys hear me? Um, the other thing, those of you that use GIS, if, um, if we move network drives around in, in your agency, and Lightroom doesn't know that, then you have to reconnect to all those files. So what I do is I tend to just store everything on an external hard drive and on my main hard drive on my computer, and then I start exporting um, as needed. Sorry uh, about this, guys. So uh, one of the questions while Bob is logging back into his computer was the URL again for where we will be posting it. It'll be on doi.gov slash creative comms. Um, and then under resources, it's the bottom left uh, little button on the, that page that it takes you to. Great. Um, and so there was another question. Yeah, the download one. Was there another question there that you saw, Rebecca, by chance in the chat? Or did you get another one? Mm, it looks like most of them are about uh, Lightroom and, and cataloging photos and um, someone, Bob, wanted to know what camera do you use for your, to shoot your photos on? Um, I use a uh, Canon EOS 5D Mark IV and a Mark III. The Bureau's software hasn't caught up to use the Mark IV uh, yet as far as the RAW converter. It works fine on the, the Mark III. But I find the Mark IV finally came out with geotagging, um, so I really like to use that. Um, whereas the Mark III and the early uh, Canon SLRs don't have that. Now there's a question, is it possible to send a raw file that you have worked on in Lightroom to someone else with, with Lightroom and they can see the original file as well as the changes that have been made? Um, yeah, and you can it, go ahead. export with the changes. Uh, you can export a raw file, you can export a JPEG, you can export a digital negative, uh, or the Adobe version of a digital raw file, a TIFF file, um, just all kinds of options. Wonderful. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for that to come up, sorry, we've had a little bit of a glitch with uh, the Lightroom software itself, so we're working on that right now. Um, any other questions? Uh, so uh, there was a question: Can can you describe the way DOI structures their photo file names? Uh, date first question mark event and location codes. Uh, he's that's a question for you, Bob. That one is not not for me. I just name them. You can name your files anything you want when you import them into Lightroom. You can use the original file name. You can have a custom name along with the date. You can add keywords to them. Um, so you would just have to talk to your um, I, IT folks as to what naming structure your bureau uses. I find it's relatively flexible 
with external affairs type uses, it might be very specific for, for data purposes. So um, it, it would vary. Do you have anything on that? From our end, we don't have any sort of guidance. I personally do it based on location um, and then any information, whether it's a full moon or the type of animal in the photo or something like that. And then if I know the date and then end it with the photographer and the bureau associated with it. Um, but that's coming from someone who works at the main interior level and keep track of all the bureau photos. Okay, great. How's it going, Bob? There, are you able to get your computer back up and running? Yep. Okay, Bob. Um, so now you can go ahead and share your screen. And we'll get back up and running. Okay. So we see that now. Um, Bob, if you can, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, so <laughs> something went wrong here. So we only have one photo in our, our catalog. So we're going to do a lot of editing on this photo <laughs> today, but I might try to add some more photos later. Um, but let's just start out with this one. So the interface, so you're looking at the interface in the library mode. If I had a bunch of photos here, like I showed earlier, this grid view, which show all those photos, you can increase or decrease the size of the thumbnails as much as you want. We have the loop view, which you can look at. You can enlarge it so it's full size for the preview. Um, we have a compare view where you can compare multiple photos, which we'll try uh, later. I just don't want to crash the system again uh, without showing you uh, everything. And then there's also a people view. And if we had people in some of these photos, we could start finding, which I, again, will try, I apologize. You can ask it to start finding faces in the entire catalog. And you want to be careful with this. If you load 10,000 photos with a lot of people into the catalog, um, it's going to take a lot of time to, to look for faces. So you might want to start doing that um, after you're done working. So obviously there were no people found on that. Um, the other thing we can do is either on import or, um, or right here, we can start organizing our photos. So for instance, if I don't like this photo, I can just mark it with an X. I'm, I'm marking this as a rejected photo. If I like it, and I'm, you know, I'm going through 100 photos here. If I like it, I hit it with the white flag, and it's one of my top 10 photos. Um, what I usually do is when I'm going through photos, if I like it, I'll just give it three stars. Um, but the other thing uh, you can do if you have a really good photo, give it five stars. And then when you go up to um, the top of the library module, um, you can, uh, or excuse me, in the grid view, oh, it's not letting me view it, but you can filter, because I only have the one photo in there, you can filter, like, just look at all the five-star photos, just look at all the three-star photos. Um, same thing with keywording. If I want to um, add a keyword, I can, um, can just go in and start tagging it with keywords. So I'm going to title this one, Oil and Gas. Oops. So that now has the keyword, Oil and Gas. I can add 50 keywords to this, 100. Um, and then if I want to look at all the oil and gas photos, I go down to filter keywords and it'll let me look at all the oil and gas photos. So I'm going to try to import some more photos and hope that this doesn't crash. So bear with me. It's good to know how to import photos too. Yeah. So again, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to re-import these. Oh, and then if I want to add keywords, say I took all these photos in Utah, I can add keywords on import too. So I usually add a few generic keywords on import. Um, and uh, so I'm going to do that, and this will probably work a little bit slowly. So let's talk about um, let's talk about a couple things in develop when these are hopefully importing. So we're moving over to the develop module, and this is a photo I took with a drone. Those of you who um, aren't familiar with the department's drone program, it's been mainly used for fire and for resource. Uh, monitoring and stuff, but it's a great public outreach tool to get you some aerial photographs. Um, 
So uh, there's a number of drone pilots. I, I got certified, it takes about a week's training and you have to get your FAA license, but it's a, a great program. And if anyone has any questions on that, let me know. Um, so with this photo, we're gonna go into the develop module and we're gonna look at, um, this is a, taken with a fisheye lens, it's totally warped. Um, so I'm gonna enable profile corrections for this camera and it automatically knows that this is a GoPro camera um, and that, that it, it you know, fixes all the aberrations or all the distortion on that lens. So here it's GoPro Hero 4. If your profile doesn't come up automatically, it'll come up with a, a giant list of, um, uh, of cameras and lenses that you can work with. So, um, so anyway, that's the other thing I can do is if, um, if I know I'm gonna be using a GoPro a lot and taking a lot of photos, I don't wanna be clicking down there every time I, I get to a GoPro photo and uh, make a, a go to that lens correction. So I just wanna add a preset here. And I'm gonna call this preset GoPro. And then anytime I'm importing, oops, I already did that. Um, anytime I'm importing photos from my GoPro, I just add that preset on import and it corrects all those automatically. So let's see if we got, Oh, it let a few photos in. Oh, it's taken its time. Um, well, let's keep working with this photo. So um, in the develop module, let's, um, you also have um, the loop view and you have a compare view where you can compare before and after effects. So this is before I made any edits to this. This is after I made some edits. But let's talk a little bit about editing. Um, the, the editing in um, Lightroom is very intuitive. Um, you really want to get to know your histogram. Those of you who are familiar with histograms, this is starting with pure black, if you see my cursor up here on the far left, and going to pure white on the right. So if you have an image that's overexposed, um, it's gonna be very far to the right because there's a lot of white pixels in there. You don't really have good data with that photo uh, if that's the way it came out of the camera. Same thing far left if it's underexposed. Now you can work with photos like this in Lightroom and bring the light uh, back into them if they're not totally blown out uh, as you took them in your camera. But you do wanna shoot for a correct exposure when you're starting out. And I think this photo is a pretty good exposure to start with. Um, if my camera, my camera usually shoots at a good light temperature, but one of the things you can do with raw files that you can't do with JPEGs is you have a lot more latitude with light temperature is, um, and light temperature is just the, the cool and warmth of the light. So we used to have different film for that, like you'd use tungsten film for uh, indoor shots and because the light was cooler, you'd use outdoor film for outdoor shots. But anyway, you can adjust that light temperature and um, if you have a neutral gray in, in your image, which I don't see much one in here, but you can use that to kind of set your light temperature too if it's really off. Um, just look for something that's neutral gray and that eyedropper will help you. Um, so the first thing you want to do with a photo when you edit it is set a white and black point. And those of you that follow Ansel Adams at all, we talked about the zone system and increasing dynamic range of your photos. Well, by doing that, watch the histogram here. I want to move my pixels up. Um, let's see, can I get this out of here? There we go. I want to move my pixels up so they're just touching the white point and just, I'm gonna move them down so they're touching the black point. And I click these two boxes because they're little warning signs if I'm going with too much uh, up or too far down. See how I move up too far and you can see that red? That means those are blown out highlights and I'm not capturing any of that data. So I just wanna back off a little bit. And then the same with the blacks, I wanna move it down till I'm just getting a few shadows. And you can, uh, whoops, that's too much. You can, uh, 
the eye doesn't mind shadows in photos. We're used to seeing some pure black, but um, seeing blown out highlights, you really want to avoid that. So, so you think of these as the anchor points on your photos. So I'm going to turn these off now so they're not in the way. And then the next thing we're going to do is start, uh, I want to bump up this area because it's pretty shadowy. Um, let's go back into this view. So I'm going to um, bump up the shadows in this. See how the shadows go back and forth. Now this doesn't move my black point. It just increases the, the exposure on those, um, those uh, other, the, the darker pixels. And if my highlights are too bright, I can bump them down here with the, uh, the whites. Um, for those of you that like shortcuts, another thing you can do is just click this auto button and it will uh, automatically set for you and it sometimes gets pretty close. Um, so I don't think that got really close. So I'm going to go back to where I was. Whoops, I went all the way back. Um, so, um, but anyway, that's, that's how, you, uh, how you work with those. Bob, while you're there, how do, how do the color editing brightness and contrast differ from Photoshop? Um, the only thing I think is different is the um, sliders are a little bit different. Like, you can't say 20% contrast in Lightroom is the same as adding 20% contrast in Photoshop. It's, um, they're different. Um, let's move on to a different photo. Um, but um, so this is this is a raw shot. So this looks pretty flat when you're looking at it. It looks flatter. Um, the one thing I should explain: those of you who who like to say you're purists and you use your camera, you turn it on landscape mode or uh, people profile mode or indoor mode, and take the photo. Your camera is doing all these adjustments for you. And and what I like to use as an analogy is you're getting a box cake out of your camera. Whereas if you want to be a baker or a chef um, and use uh, your, you know, your skills that you learn in, in Lightroom to make those adjustments on your own and have that creative control, then you're going to do that in Lightroom and, and shoot raw images. So, um, and those of you again I'm, that follow Ansel Adams know that he spent a lot more time in the um, darkroom than he did in uh, taking the actual photos. So we're going to bump Again, we're just going to bump the uh, the whites and blacks on this again. A little bit of shadow. I'm going to pull the shadows up. Um, and one of the things I might mention, we have two sliders that, that are really cool, um, are clarity and vibrance. See how if I drop vibrance down, it's decreasing contrast in the middle range of the photo. Whereas if I pop it up, it increases um, the contrast. Whereas the contrast slider, think of this like a scalpel and the contrast slider like a hammer. This increases contrast throughout every pixel from black to white, where the uh, clarity is a much more subtle. Same thing with vibrance. Vibrance just adjusts color in the, the more muted colors. So if you pop it up a little bit, those of you that remember Velvia film, the old uh, uh, film that had some really nice color to it, vibrance of about 33 kind of mimics that. Whereas if you move saturation, even the, um, the, um, the most bright colors are going to be bumped up. And that's where you get into what's known as overbaking a photo. Um, any of these shifts really should be subtle. Um, it, as subtle as you can get um, without overdoing it. Um, one of the things, let's start, so we're, we've done some overall adjustments to this photo, and uh, let's see what it looked like before. You know, just again, very subtle, but it's coming out more. Um, this sky seems a little bit blown out, so I'm gonna use, start using some spot filters. Um, and these are some of the, uh, the spot development or the, the targeted development tools you can use. This is, those of you that used to do film development, this is a neutral, uh, takes the place of a neutral density filter. So I'm gonna pull this down and it's just changing the part of the photo that I pulled it over. 
and I overdid the underexposure on this, but I want to underexpose that just a little bit, increase the clarity just a little bit to bring the sky out some. Um, so, uh, so again, we've gotten from a, um, a pretty flat looking raw photo to what I think is a very passable photo without, without very much work. Um, let's look at a few other edits here. Let's see how our slow. Um, now this is, if, if you can't get this edit down, um, come see me because this is my most annoying thing in um, photographs is when somebody has the ocean tilting off the end of the world. This is actually Lake Huron. Very simple going in here. I'm using this uh, crop overlay tool. Um, what I can do with this, if I want to lock the aspect so that it stays the same as my original photo, I can do that or I can unlock it. But all I need to do is, um, is just, um, let's see, I don't usually use this, but you can just run this line right along here and it, it just sets you, you back up. And then um, once you get out of that, There we go. Well, that's a little better. Let's, you know, I usually do it by hand, just eyeball it. So, you, I mean, I'm using that. Well, obviously that's not by hand. Um, <laughs> this delay is just making it a little hard. So let's move to another photo and play around a little bit. Bob, one question is sure. someone said they missed uh, how you pulled the line down from the top to adjust exposure. So when you start on the new one, could you double back and, and make sure they see what you had done? Yeah. Previously? So if you hover, hover on this, this is just called a graduated filter. I just click on this, and uh, again, we're getting a delay. I pull this cursor down where I want it, and I just start pulling it down. Now, when I spread this out, it, uh, it makes the dissolve between full, this is full neutral density filter, this is zero. It makes it a little uh, broader uh, transition, so it's, it's much easier to work with, uh, or much easier to blend in. And you can see see how that works. Um, if you want to get rid of something, oops, just click the delete button. Okay, now this is something we all need to deal with. Is uh, this photograph was taken about 11 noon time on a very harsh sunny day in Palm Springs. These guys all had hats on, um, and uh, it was it's just like man, how do you get um, anybody's face showing up here with all the contrast in here. Well, again, some very simple edits. I'm just pulling the shadows out of this. This should be popping up. Huh, it didn't seem to do much. Okay, well, we will, we'll work with our brush tool on this one. And, um, I'm going to see if I can bump up the exposure a little bit on this. So I'm, this is so this brush tool is the same as your overall edits. It's just only making the edits where the brush itself goes. So I can go over this guy's face and just start bringing out a lot more light. Same with this little girl's face. And obviously. This is 1.15, that's a little bit much. I'm gonna turn that down a little. I'm gonna bump up the shadow. Yeah, the shadows are, are working on this, that's interesting. Well, but anyway, you can see how you can play with these, these really local edits. Um, there's also a red eye reduction. I'm not gonna go over that because I don't have any red eye photos, but you just get this, get the crosshair right on the red eye, hit it and it'll pull the red eye out of any photos that you have. Um, and let's see, there's also those of you that have old cameras, um, there's a spot removal tool which you can use. Um, I'm going to hit visualize spots and, and this shows that uh, 
I've got a, um, a spot on my sky, on a blue sky, that's just a piece of dust on my camera. So I'm gonna hit this, and it's gonna get rid of that spot. I'm gonna use heal. I'm gonna move my opacity to 100%, and that gets rid of that, uh, rid of that spot. Um, another thing, if you're vain or if you work a lot with uh, high-level um, folks in the department, um, I need to reset this. This is me, and um, yeah, anyway, sorry, we're having a little sluggishness here on this. Um, hmm. Okay, so we're gonna. So you can see I've got these ugly bags under my eyes, which drive me crazy. So I'm gonna use the spot removal tool. I'm gonna put it on heal. If you do clone, let me do a clone. It's gonna pick somewhere and actually clone that data. Um, so I don't wanna do that. I'm really messing myself up here. So I'm gonna go over to heal and uh, I'm gonna shrink this way down. And I'm just going to go under the bags in my eyes or your state director. You want to make sure it picks up a, a textured spot that's smooth, not like my beard down there. So you can move, whoops, sorry. You can, uh, <laughs> this delay is killing me. Anyway, let's, uh, let's go back. If you look at my, um, my right or left eye, you can see the, the bags are gone where I've added a new little goatee under my, my right eye. But, but you get the, the picture. You can get rid of um, uh, photo um, defects, whether it's lens flare or, or some other problems. Um, let's move along and try some other stuff. Bob, while you're looking around, um, someone asked that they've seen Lightroom tutorials where they recommend a top to bottom workflow um, of the editing panel. And you started with blacks and whites and worked your way up. How do you think through the editing process of, of where to start on the panel? You know, I, would, I actually started with the temperature, which is basic. Um, and I don't mess with tint much, but if you have a problem with tint, you can move it that slider back and forth. And then I do move to exposure. It's just the image I started with was, was fine exposure-wise. I don't use contrast much because, again, it's kind of a hammer versus a uh, scalpel. I like to use um, clarity more. Although, you know, I will use contrast if, if I have to, if I want to make a photo pop. Um, I just read a tutorial a couple of weeks ago. I used to use these four in whatever order I wanted, but the um, tutorial I read really said, work your whites and blacks as, as your anchor points, and then go back to your shadows and highlights to, um, to deal with the subtleties between your black and white anchor points. So, I thought that made a lot of sense, and um, so I've been following that lately. But I, you know, I bet one of the things I can say for sure is if you go online, you would find arguments against that. Everyone has has their own workflow, but whoever made that point is totally correct. This um, Lightroom is set up intuitively to follow the workflow down through each of the um, the different uh, tools here. And trust me, you can get by using two or three of these tools. Don't get overwhelmed by, by all the tools. But you should do your overall adjustments, and then you should go back and start doing your, uh, your other adjustments. That's, that's another way that, uh, that you work. Those of you that, that do black or night sky photos, your camera really doesn't do very well with light temperature at night. This one's actually not that bad, but some people prefer a little bluer, so I'm turning that down. A little bluer. I'm setting a, a high white point on this, but not too high because I don't want it to look like daylight. So unlike 
a daytime photo, I'm not moving that up to, to the edge there. Um, so that's about all I'm gonna do on this. I'll probably increase the clarity a little bit, see how that builds those mid-tone high, uh, the contrast and bump the vibrance up a little. That's probably a little too much, that's a little too blue. Um, another thing I can do, I know I'm jumping around here, but if I think that's a little bit too blue, um, I can decrease the saturation just on the blues by dropping down here. See how that knocks the saturation back? So I'm just gonna bump that back a little bit because it seems a little overblown. Um, so also on the night sky photos, I personally, you have to come up with your own, um, your own level. This isn't journalism. I'm trying to, to get an image out there that's pleasing. So if it's a human intrusion, I will remove it sometimes, like I do um, contrails in night sky photos. So again, I can just use that healing brush and get rid of this. Um, and then uh, another thing I might point out, so we'll go back to the library. So you can see that um, that's gone now. Um, but if you go, Um, one of the cool things about this photo, there's another contrail, but there's actually a couple uh, meteorites in here. And the way you see meteorites compared to contrails is they have a teardrop shape. I've seen a lot of photos whenever there's a big meteor shower that they're like, look at all these meteors and they're actually airport. I'm saying contrails, I mean light trails from airplanes, I'm sorry. Um, but one of the other things with night sky photos is you're using like 3200 or 6400 ISO. So it's a good uh, place where you can uh, practice with noise reduction because you get a lot of digital noise in your photos. And that's one of the last things you do on your image. This is the last thing I'm doing on this image is I'm gonna work to reduce the noise on this. So I'm bumping this up really high because it's big noise. See how all that noise disappeared? But unfortunately, the other thing that does is makes the photo softer. So you can see it's a lot softer. You don't see quite as many um, stars in it. So you also want to sharpen it. And so you want to play with these two sliders. Sharpening is not good for people's faces. If you sharpen too much, um, you bring out all the, um, all the little defects. I'm not showing my face on the sharpening. Um, Man, nah, it's going too slow. While Bob's computer is catching up, um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. We've reserved the time for a little longer. So um, as long as everybody else is willing to keep going, um, I think, Bob, you have some time left so we can keep going past the hour till maybe like 3.20. Does that work for everybody? Yeah, I do. And I, I there's a lot more that we can, can cover here. I, um, Apologize that, uh, let's see, how am I doing? I'm trying to get up there. Yeah, so I can stay as long as, as folks want. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, there we go. So we're, <laughs> we're gonna, I just wanna talk about um, plugins a minute. So I've got, these are all plugins that I have in Lightroom. There's dozens of them out there. There's HDR plugins, there's, um, you, you can have Photoshop as a plugin. So I'm gonna edit this Lightroom photo. I probably shouldn't have done that as slow as it is, but this should open up Photoshop and it'll let me edit this Lightroom photo in Photoshop. We can take a few more questions while this is opening. Um, all right, so I think there have been quite a few questions about the difference between Photoshop and Lightroom and people have been sharing the reasons why they prefer Lightroom to Photoshop. Um, before we started this class, Bob had talked to me about it um, and said about batch editing, which gets us into another question, which is what kinds of actions can be batch processed, keyword, file date, what else? Uh, well, develop settings are the big thing. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna really quickly, just because of time, I'm gonna change some things with this photo. Um, 
And then see, I have four photos that are like this. And if I'm doing a, um, if I'm doing a time-lapse photo, I might have 400 photos like this. And all I have to do is edit this one photo well, which I didn't do here, but go into sync. And it'll say, which of these settings do you want to sync? Do you want white balance? Do you want all of your development? Uh, do you want all your local adjustments? Or maybe I don't. Um, and then all I do is hit synchronize, boom, 400 photos, in this case four, but 400 photos will be edited by that. Um, so it, it, you know, again, you can do some, some really quick edits to lots of photos. If you, you know, you can use all these different presets that um, Lightroom has built into it to do edits on photos, or you can uh, um, do, uh, do some uh, individual ones. So, um, oh, here's the Photoshop. Let's see if it came up. Okay, let's get Photoshop because it's it's being very. This is. I think it's just because we're in another network. Um, the other thing I'll show is uh, photo. Um, if you want to do photo merge, uh, I think the. Uh, the photo merge in Photoshop is superior to Lightroom, but Lightroom actually has some cool features to it. So let's see if we can merge these three photos into a, a panorama. While well, it's chugging along on that. A little, um, Bob, while it's chugging along, can you explain temp? Oh, color temperature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just, um, again, you're, with a RAW file, your camera's just shooting um, pixels and, uh, and data, but with a JPEG, it'll set a color temperature for you, whether it's daylight. Like, a cloudy day has a different color temperature than a sunny day does, or a different temperature than indoor fluorescent lighting. Each light source has its own temperature. and um, so Lightroom, if you shoot raw, your camera might have gotten it wrong and you can adjust that temperature just so that, you know, if, if you were out there at a, a nice warm sunset evening and you get the photo back and it looks blue, you realize, well, that wasn't what it looked like out there. And one of the basic adjustments you can, um, can do to get it uh, back um, to what you saw is, is adjusting that temperature. Um, I find that my Canon almost always gets color temperature pretty close except at night. And uh, sometimes indoors, there's some issues too. And then how does that relate to white balance color temperature? They're the same thing. Okay, great. Okay, so it's coming along here. <laughs> um, well, you're thinking about you know, this. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna cancel this. Just, just so you know, you can do panorama, panoramas. Um, the other thing, oh, go ahead if you would have a question. Um, people had questions about the advantage of using DNG um, and or the disadvantages of DNG files. Yeah, DNG, when you go to import photos or videos, um, it'll give you a choice um, whether or not to import them as a raw file, as a JPEG, or as, as a DNG. And DNG is just a uh, public uh, uh, um, raw file format that Adobe used, hoping that the world would look at it as a perfect way to, um, to, to have universality among um, uh, raw files. Because every time you get a new camera, if Adobe or some other program doesn't have a raw file converter, you're kind of either having to download it or wait till they catch up with your new camera. Whereas if you um, have DNG conversion, then that's pretty universally recognized by, by all software. Personally, I don't use it that much, but again, you can see if I wanna copy this or export it as a DNG, I, I can do that. I don't think it's taken off like Adobe really hoped it would, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, but it is, you know, it, it has its values. Um, those of you that want to work in black and white, I might just point out the, the thing that you would think um, to do would initially be, well, let me just get rid of the, um, the saturation in my photo. Um, 
that's not what you want to do. Um, you want to go down to the black and white setting here and uh, and it'll allow you to, and you want to look at the, the colors that are in your photo and um, adjust those. Let me close Photoshop here. I don't know why this is, okay, here we go. So I'm going to go into black and white. Um, and I know there's a lot of blue in this photo, and Ansel Adams was great for wanting dark skies in his photos. He used infrared filters a lot. So I'm going to drop this blue down so it's really dark. See how it makes that photo pop? And I know the aspens are yellow. Maybe I want to give this a little bit of a pop here and an IR look. See how you can adjust those color or that, that tone? Um, so if you're doing black and white photography, you want to work in this. Or if you want to adjust, um, just individual colors. Like a lot of times if my skies are too dark, if I'm using a polarizer, I'll just bump that luminance up and it'll make my skies lighter. So that's, that's just another trick. Um, let's move into the map module just really briefly. It's a really easy module to use. You need to be online to use it. Um, if you have GPS on your camera, it'll show you exactly where this photo is. This is, um, uh, Corona Arch in Utah. Um, if you don't have GPS, um, you can just drag and drop that photo to a photo point and uh, it'll, it'll put those GPS factors in there. And you can, the map's actually pretty good. I'll, um, let's see, what can I put you? So I'm putting Yaquina Head, Oregon. See, it took me, Took me right to Yaquina Head, um, and uh, if this photo was from Yaquina Head, which it's not, but I could just drop it down there, and uh, it's it's not letting me. No, oh, it is. So I just ruined the GPS data on that. But anyway, you can see that. So that's the map module. Really easy to use. Um, if I click on this, it'll take me to the spot. Um, it, you know, it'll, it's running slow right now, but it'll take you to where that photo was taken. The print module is also very intuitive. Um, if you want to um, go in and do a, a contact sheet, let's pick up like four photos and do a, a contact sheet on those. It's a little delay here. So Bob, well, that's coming up. Um, We've had people say that this is a great class and they wanted to know what our next one is. Um, and we want their help in figuring it out. Um, our next class for January will be about um, photo primer or video primers and prepping and all the advanced work before going out and shooting. But we also want to know what you guys want to see after that. So we've got a poll up um, that Art has put up for us so you can help us decide. And while we're looking at the poll, I'll just mention on the printing, those of you that do a lot of data collection, um, this is running slow, so we won't pull it up now, but you can hop in there and do contact sheets with 2, 4, 8, 16, whatever print you, you want. You can show the file names, you can show the GPS coordinates on captions underneath, what date they were taken, what the aspect was that the camera was facing. So. That's all, you don't have to write any of that down. As long as your camera captures it, um, it'll be shown in the, um, on, on that uh, uh, caption. So it's really cool. Just, again, that's where Lightroom is great. Um, if you're only editing 10 photos a year or a day even, and you're, you're really good at Photoshop, fine. Um, it, it's got uh, more to it than, than Lightroom as far as doing really detailed edits. But, but if you do have to deal with a large volume of photos and you, you need to organize them so that you can get to them quickly. Oh, and then we should also talk export. So let's go file. I'm going to export these. So I go back into the library module to do that. Hit export. So I want to export to a specific folder. Uh, it can be onto a flash drive, whatever I want it to do. Um, I can rename the file, uh, give it any type of file name when I export it. Um, if I want to uh, export it as a JPEG, 
I can resize it to any size I want. Say I'm just using it for email or for the, the web. Maybe I just want it to be, um, you know, 500 pixels across, 500. Um, so you can do all that. You can do output sharpening. You can include all the metadata. Uh, I can export a thousand photos at a time or a hundred photos at a time on this. I can just export the ones that I gave five stars to. Um, I can use the um, uh, editor to, to just pull up photos um, that, that have five stars and export those. So it's really slick that way. Um, let's see. Also, I just want to mention. Uh, oh, while you're there, um, is so your workflow is that you export them to an external drive. Is the question? It just depends on what I'm using them for. A lot of times, I'll export them to my desktop and then I'll move them elsewhere. Um, you know, I'll I'll export them and then email them. You can. I haven't used these interfaces for Flickr or Facebook on my government computer because again, I don't have access to them, but you can set up at least on your own home computer to, to go directly into Facebook or Flickr. And uh, we might want to explore that as an agency too. And do you know, is it possible to export directly to Google Photos? I don't know about that. I'm okay. sure it is. Um, let's just look at this video a second. Lightroom does not edit video, but one thing it allows you to do is um, you can use this pull down menu and capture a frame from the video. So um, if I like this particular frame or I zoom along and like another one, I just click capture frame and it'll put that still frame down into my uh, library and I can work with that. So, so that's a nice simple use of it. But if you get beyond just that frame capture or storage and keywording, you want to use Adobe Premiere or some other program to actually do your, your edits for your, uh, your video. Um, Lightroom also has HDR in it. I'm not going to use that right now because it's going a little slow, but you literally just go up here, photo, photo merge, HDR, and it'll pop these out as an HDR image and you can do some fine tuning on it later. There's also, I use some plugin programs for my HDR that I find are a little better than Lightroom, but I, you know, I'm getting pretty impressed with how Lightroom does it. So Bob, we're at 308 um, and we have a number of questions. So okay. I don't know if you have other stuff to cover. Or... Um, you know, I do, but what I would like to say is, you know, because we got a little bit of a late start, um, you know, we could even do a, an advanced webinar sometime down the road, or if a smaller group of folks want to do something, or we could even, um, you know, just feel free to call me anytime when you have questions too. I'm uh, at rwick at blm.gov and my phone number is 916-216-7704. That's my cell number. So feel free to call me um, and definitely use the internet browser to, to find your, uh, some answers to some of these really specific questions. But but just remember the modules, libraries for organizing and keywording and sorting. The develop has as many tools as you need for most of your developing. And then you can uh, export for what you need uh, to use them for. So on our questions, most of them are about tagging and metadata. But one, while we're um, on the editing side, is... Um, let me find it now. Can you best describe, or can you describe the best way for haze reduction in a photo? Um, you know, I use contrast, but there's actually in the newest version, I was, let me see if we can pull, here's a hazy photo. It's one of the things that we didn't quite get to. There's actually this cool haze reduction tool um, down at the bottom. In the develop module, you go down to keep scrolling down. I don't know why they have it way at the bottom, but there's a dehaze filter. And um, this will pop up. Why don't we go to the next question and I'll dehaze this in a minute. Okay. Um, so is there a metadata field in Lightroom for alt text? Uh, explain alt text, I guess. 
Alt text is the alternative text for people who are visually impaired, um, who need it uh, so that their screen readers can, can, can describe what's on the photo. Now, let's hold that question. I bet there is, but I, you know, that's one of those really detailed questions I'd have to search around for a while okay. to find it. But whoever that is, they can give me a follow-up call. Um, I believe that was Michael Quinn from the National Park Service's Grand Canyon. Um, okay. And then we also, um, when our changes are changes saved in a separate file from the original, or when you make edits, do they override the original file? No, when you make edits, that's the other beauty of Lightroom. With Photoshop, you have to save your layers, and, and um, with Lightroom, you're always, um, you can always go back to your original file. Um, basically, um, in the develop module, if the develop module would come up, there's a reset button right down here where my cursor is, and you just hit that and it resets right back to your original. Um, so you can also hit Control Z and it'll take you back step by step. Or there's also um, in the develop module, there's a history panel over here that you can um, go back in history. You can see all the edits that you made, go back anywhere you want. But no, your the sidecar file rests with the um, with the library and with the catalog. So um, it, it never changes your file. Um, so do you use Lightroom to tag your photos? Um, to, I, there, there's where I tag them. I can, um, I can use uh, different tools uh, to tag. There's, um, there's a little spray paint can here. You can tag them by name. So I want to tag this with a keyword. And uh, is this what we're getting at tagging? Um, test. So I'm using the keyword test, and I'm going to use that on this photo, this photo, this photo. You know, I could use people, app, dedication, whatever I want to tag it as, and I can pull that that up out of my database. Mm -hmm. So see, that has test on it now as a keyword. Um, while we're covering that, is can you attach a photo release form or copyright form to photos or to a catalog? You can do it in the metadata. Um, let's see, so we would go, yes, you can. I'll say that. The metadata allows you to attach copyright. You can, when you um, send stuff out, you can have a watermark on it with the copyright or a caption, or it can be in the metadata with a copyright. Same thing, you could uh, just type specialized information. Um, I don't know if there's a specific tag for photo release, but you could just write that in as, as data. So another question along those lines, which I think you answered, but just to clarify, it sounds like metadata can be placed directly on printed photos? Yes. Okay, great. Um, looking through, um, there's other questions about can Lightroom be used to share and store photos within an org and can you also share with people who do not have Lightroom? The only thing you can do with that is just you can export the photos like I share with folks in our office here in DC all the time but I just export them onto a flash drive and then they can either put them in their Lightroom library um, most of the photos I share get put up on the, the BLM's Flickr site. So that, to me, is the easiest way for people to access them versus uh, having them buried in some network folder. But um, I don't, I would not want to have this, my files on a network drive that somebody else could access. It'd be like having your Word documents up there where anybody could edit them. I think you want to export them to share them with others. That's just my, um, you know, I, I could just see that being a train wreck. Um, another question, which is that when I import photos, does that action create physical copies of those photos and thus use my computer storage space? Um, if so, should, should this person only import the photos that uh, they want to edit? 
So when you go in, so I'm going into file and I'm gonna do import photos and videos. Um, so I can move these photos, I can copy them, or I can just add them to, to the, the catalog. So what you're doing, if you add a photo to a catalog, you're not moving it. Say I have an external hard drive with 5,000 photos on it. I don't really wanna move those, so I'm just gonna hit add to catalog. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna develop that sidecar editing file, and it's gonna develop a preview that'll show up on my screen, but it's not gonna physically move that, that whole file. So, you know, again, my, I have 30,000 photos on my um, catalog from this year. Uh, they were taking up about 15 gigs, whereas my, um, my external hard drive was about three terabytes. So obviously you can't store that on your computer. Um, the other thing, if you click, if you look at this box here, build smart previews, um, that's kind of a cool thing in that it doesn't move your photos, um, but what it does is if your external hard drive with your, um, with your uh, photos on it is not um, at, you know, attached to your computer, you can still edit those preview files um, and you can actually export them for use on the web because they're about 2,000 pixels across, whereas my raw files are about 6,000 pixels across. But, um, so you can do that. Um, I think we're getting close to the end. Uh, I'm not here sure why go. the screen sharing stopped. Uh, here we go. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, if there's other, other questions. Um, there are, there's a question about what's your best online resource for Lightroom training, obviously besides this Bob Wick training class. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this will go down in. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I like lynda.com. They have some good trainings, um, lots of them. And, uh, you know, I've picked, I actually had my own workflow set up before I put on this training, and I picked up some things off of Linda's tutorials that I'm like, Wow, I should have been doing that years ago. So, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, I think what's the vendor that we have? Um, uh, DOI University. Yeah, DOI University has some external um, vendors that that have Lightroom training as well. I haven't tried those out yet. And then I know some of the bureaus do have Linda. Linda with a Y, L Y N D A dot com have um, have. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing contracts with Linda, so they have logins. So you might want to check with your bureau to see if you have access to lynda.com. Great. Okay, any other questions? Um, we have some more questions about metadata, which is when you export copies of a file, can that metadata be saved with each individual file? Um, like is impossible, or like is possible with bridge no it can be saved with each one okay or yes it can be saved and then one. is it viewable in non-photo editing programs like windows explorer well that's where you would want to export a jpeg file and um, and use that so if i hit this is uh, this photo of me and go into or are these five photos and export them as JPEGs, you can view them in any, it's a universal file format. Now, if you export it as a raw file or as a DMG, the, the Adobe Digital Negative, no. You just need to make sure you, you export it as a file type. Um, now, the catalog can't be viewed in other programs. It's exclusive to Lightroom. And then can you edit any type of photo in here, like an iPhone JPEG? Mm -hmm. Yep, you just uh, upload it into the catalog. And then our last two questions I think we have are about the drone program that you mentioned earlier, um, which is that uh, the first one, um, someone said that they were breaking, you were breaking up, but did you say you were somehow able to fly a drone within a national park? Um, each agency has its own policy for drones with the, the BLM we have to do uh, project aviation safety plan and get it signed off by the local office. With the Park Service, 
you need to go through a little bit more of a review process uh, that has to be signed off on, I believe, by the park superintendent, and you have to justify, uh, you know, a reasonable use of that. So you would want to go through your um, agency aviation uh, manager for that. But um, I believe, like DOI, I believe, is still the largest user of drones uh, outside of the Department of Defense, and the FAA has given us a lot of flexibility to use them, but they still treat drones like any other aircraft, even though we use these little GoPro drones, you need to again get your FAA certification as well as go through a week of uh, training that, uh, I know the BLM, we have our own internal training that's Office of Aircraft Services certified, but OAS also does some specific courses. And it's, it's really well done and uh, a great tool for outreach. Great, I think that covers it for our um, questions that we have. So we appreciate everybody um, joining us today and uh, sticking along with our little technology snafu um, on our end. Uh, but we much uh, appreciate it and we'll be posting this online, online and then sending it around um, with an email so that you have the link in your inbox along with the information on how to get uh, Adobe Creative Cloud products like Lightroom. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Call anytime you have questions.